Heavenly Father, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to us now and direct us in the path of your commands, for there we find delight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning we finish our series in the book of Philippians, and the Apostle Paul wants to acknowledge the generous support that the Philippians have provided him. As he's been going around the Roman Empire and sharing the gospel, the Philippians have been providing for his needs. Now, how have they provided for his needs? Well, we see that they provided for him even as recent converts. We see that they were generous to him by the fact that even when they were newly acquainted with the gospel, they were providing for his needs. We see that in verse 15. If you've got a church Bible, have it open before you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, we read, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel... When I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. How was this church generous? Well, it was by giving to the Apostle Paul even when they were new converts and when no one else was supporting the Apostle Paul. We saw that in verse 15. It says, uh, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. And they were a church that repeatedly gave to the Apostle Paul and supported him in his ministry. We read that in verse 16. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And as a result of their generous giving, the Apostle Paul could say that he was amply supplied for. Verse 18. Verse 18, I have received full payment and even more, I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. This whole letter has been a letter which is really from a missionary to a supporting church, acknowledging what they've done in supporting him, and particularly more recently with uh, Epaphroditus, one of their own church members who had gone to the Apostle Paul and given a, a gift to him to support him in his needs. And he's, of course, encouraging them in the faith and encouraging them to stand as one man uh, for the sake of the gospel. But he's also wanting to acknowledge that they have supported him. So how does he do this? How does he conclude his letter by acknowledging their support? He's mentioned their support, the kind of support that they've given him and how generous it has been. But the Apostle Paul, interestingly here, does not come out directly and say thank you to the Philippians. There's no mention of the word of thanks here at the end of this letter. So what does the Apostle Paul do in order to acknowledge the gifts that have been sent? He acknowledges what they have done, but how does he acknowledge it as an appreciation? Well, he shows an appreciation for the gifts, definitely. Uh, we see that in verse 10, verse 10 of Philippians chapter 4. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. He shows that he, he rejoices in what they've given him. He also shows that he, uh, he, he recognises that it's good of them to give to him. In verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. So he's acknowledging that what they've done, and then he's saying it was a good thing that they have provided for his needs. But what does the Apostle Paul particularly want to do as he acknowledges their gifts? Well, he's wanting to acknowledge that God is the one who should be glorified by the gifts. He wants God to be glorified by what is given. And we see that in verse 10. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. He wants to acknowledge that God is the one who is responsible behind the gifts that have been given. And he says that he says something similar in verse 13. He says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And it's not a case of I can do everything through the Philippians and the support that they've given. No, it's through him who gives me strength, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he also acknowledges God's glory in verse 20. Verse 20, where he finishes this section, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. How does the Apostle Paul acknowledge the gifts that have been sent? Well, he talks about them. He says how good it was of the Philippians to give, and he wants glory to go to God. But one thing you notice in the text is that he doesn't want to give the impression that he's looking for more gifts from the Philippians by acknowledging the gifts. Look with me at verse 17. Not that I'm looking for a gift. He wants to be clear that he's not writing this at the end of the letter so that he'll get more support from the Philippians, that he's somehow seeking out getting some more. No, he doesn't want to do that. But what does he want to do? He wants to give glory to God, and there's something else in verse 17 that he wants to do in response to uh, the gift that the Philippians have given. Verse 17, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. 
As he acknowledges the gift that the Philippians have given so that he is supported as he's been traveling around and even supported while he's there in prison for the sake of the gospel, he wants to acknowledge what has been given and make sure that the Philippians know about the credit that is coming to them as a result of their giving, the credit that is coming to their account. The idea here, the words that are used, and you can translate the word uh, that's translated credit in the NIV, it's actually the word for fruit, it's a common word for fruit, but it is used in a financial context, which is why the NIV has translated it in that way. The ESV has fruit that increases to your credit, and the New American Standard, probably the best translation, has the profit which increases to your account, really putting it in financial terms, as the the church has been probably financially very kind to the Apostle Paul. He then is using financial terms to say that there is a profit that is coming to your account, that is increasing to your account. This word increasing is absent from the, the NIV, but there's this idea of abounding, like compound interest. Like you're getting credit and then on that credit you get more credit and then more credit and more credit. It continues to increase. It's not like you get one lump sum payment and then that is it of interest. No, there is a continuing interest that comes to your account as a result of the gift that you have given. Now what is this credit that is coming to their account? What does the Apostle Paul want the, ch the church in Philippi to think about? Not to think about the gift per se, but to think about the credit that is coming as a result of the gift. Well, it's not praise from Paul. He's not giving them praise himself, but he wants them to recognize that the credit that is coming to their account is really God's pleasure with them. And we see that described for us in the following verses. Verse 18, he says, I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. You have God's pleasure. That's part of your credit coming to your account, that God is pleased with you because of the gifts that you have given. And there's another promise that is made in verse 20 as to the credit that will come to their account. What is in verse 20? And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God promises to meet the needs of the generous people of Philippi in giving to the work of the Apostle Paul, to giving to his work as the Apostle Paul has gone around preaching Christ's gospel. He promises to meet the needs of those who are generous. And that is a promise that is given again and again in the pages of Scripture. We heard that read for us from Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, it says, One man gives freely, yet gains even more. A generous man, what happens to the generous man? He gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. He hangs on to what he has but he comes to poverty. And then it continues, verse 25, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. This is a promise that is made again and again through the pages of scripture, that as you are generous to the Lord's work, the blessing of God comes and he meets all your needs. Now, what sort of needs are we talking about? When the promise is given to us in verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs, what is being spoken of there? Well, of course, material needs are met by God. Of course, the ultimate fulfillment of our needs, our material needs come, our bodily needs come in heaven itself. All material needs are met when we pass into glory as believers in Christ Jesus, as God's people. There's no hunger, there's no thirst, there's no pain, there's no death. All those needs that our body has, they're all met by God for all of eternity. But it's also the case in this life. God will meet our needs, our material needs. Don't most Christians have an abundance, have an abundance so that they can supply the needs as God has supplied them with the abundance? We've got to be careful here that in reaction to false teaching, we cannot make the text purely about God meeting our needs for eternity that God does meet our needs in this world. Just because some clown out there with a pulpit says that God will give you Learjets and luxury mansions, that then means that we as Christians have to only look at glory as for meeting our needs and we can't enjoy good things in this world. We can't look to the Lord 
to make our work successful and to supply our needs. Doesn't the Lord's prayers teach us to pray, give us this day our daily bread? We're meant to look to God to supply our needs in this world, as well as, of course, in the next. And sometimes, a lot of the time, he supplies not just our daily bread, but a little bit of chocolate to go with it. After it, he supplies our needs in abundance in this world. As God's people are generous to the work of the gospel, God meets their needs again and again. Yes, of course, in certain parts of the world where the church is heavily persecuted, yes. But even then, God is often supplying their material needs in different ways. But it's not just our material needs that are met by God. It's, of course, our spiritual needs are met. The ultimate fulfillment, of course, of our spiritual need is met at etern in eternity, where we will have perfect knowledge of God. Our spiritual need at the moment is to know God. But sadly, because of sin, we cannot know him as we should. But in eternity, when we pass into glory, we will meet him face to face in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will live perfectly holy lives. We will have complete sanctification, complete holiness in the glory that is to come. But even now, we have our spiritual needs met as well. This promise that is given in verse 19, and God will meet all your needs is fulfilled somewhat in this world as well. Don't we have forgiveness of sins now? Does, not God, tr does God treat us as our sins deserve? No, he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve in this world. And he does give us understanding. Despite our sinful minds, he does give us understanding of himself. You think of the generous Philippians. What did God bless them with in accordance with their spiritual need of knowledge of God? What did he give them as a result of giving to the Apostle Paul? What did they receive? They received a book of the Bible written to them. What a privilege. There's all these kinds of false teachers out there, Paul warns about them, going around teaching false doctrine. And, of course, other churches, they would be struggling with such teachers coming to them and trying to work out what is the right thing to believe about God. The Philippians, as a result of giving to the Apostle Paul, they received a letter from Paul himself, which was not just the words of Paul, but was the word of God. What a blessing. What a meeting of need in this world by God as these generous Philippians had given to the work of the Apostle Paul. And of course, one of the great spiritual needs that we have in this world is for people to pray for us. And what did the Philippians have in this world as a result of supporting the Apostle Paul? They had the prayers of the Apostle Paul going up before heaven for them. He speaks of them in, in, chapter, in chapter 1, verse 9. He says in verse 9 of chapter 1, And this is my prayer, that your love, thinking of the Philippians, may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. That prayer, excellent prayer, prayed by an excellent man, the, the Apostle Paul, for the Philippians. As a result of what? Them giving to the Apostle Paul. Their needs were being met in this world. Their spiritual need of prayer was being met by the apostle and other companions of the apostle Paul who had been joining in prayer for the Philippians. And of course, the Philippians had a great need for fellowship and godliness, growth in godliness and doing good works. And that need was being met as a result of God's blessing upon them. We see that the Apostle Paul says in chapter 2, verse 12, when we looked at it more closely when I preached on it, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. They'd always obeyed. They were able to do what is right, and God was working through them, supplying that need to do what is right. They were having their spiritual needs met. This promise that God would meet their needs as a result of their generosity was being fulfilled. So what are we to do with this letter? What are we supposed to do with this part of the letter of the Apostle Paul? Well, there's often a similar situation today, and I'm very conscious of that here in my situation here at Des Moines Baptist Church. Now, I'm no Apostle Paul but I do feel a similar tension. Like the Philippians, some of you have given repeatedly 
to the work that I'm trying to do here at Dremoyne Baptist in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You've given repeatedly. We saw that with the, uh, the Philippians in verse 16. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. I've been in great need over the 13 or so years that I've been here. And you have given again and again. Many of you repeatedly again and again have given. Also, like the Apostle Paul, some of you have given as new converts. That's what he says in verse 15. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. They, many of you have actually given, even when you have been newly converted to the faith, you have been generous to the work here at Des Moines Baptist. And not only that, you are people who have given when no one else was supporting me. I see that in myself there somewhat in verse 15. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the name of giving, a matter of giving and receiving except you only. No, when I graduated from Bible college, there was no other option. Uh, Dremoyne Baptist was the one that wanted to have me be the preaching elder here at Dremoyne. And, uh, and so I feel a tension there with the Apostle Paul as well. And like the Apostle Paul, I can say that I am amply supplied because of your gifts. That's what he says in verse 18. I've received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied. Over the decade that I've been here, I've been amply supplied. My children, my wife have been able to eat. We've been able to have a, a roof over our head continuously, a bed to sleep in, clothes on our backs. We are amply supplied by your generosity here. So how do I acknowledge the gifts that you have given over the years? Well, like the Apostle Paul, should I be careful not to look for more gifts? That's what he says in verse 17. Not that I'm looking for a gift. I have to be careful that I'm not looking for more and following the path of greediness. I also, should, shouldn't I want glory to go to God as I acknowledge the generosity that you have given over the, the years, as the Apostle Paul did, that it is, I rejoice greatly in the Lord for what you have given. And then, shouldn't I follow the Apostle Paul's example? And rather than focusing on what you've given and looking for more, shouldn't I focus on the fruit? Yes, let's do that. Let's focus on the fruit that has come, the credit that has come as a result of your generosity over the years. Have you considered the credit, the credit that has abounded to your account because of your gifts over the years here at Dremoyne Baptist? What credit am I talking about? Well, God's pleasure. What is said of the Philippians so many years ago is said of you. That is an acceptable, pleasing sacrifice before God, what you have given. God is pleased with what you have given. Have you considered that? And have you considered that God has promised to meet all your needs as a result of your generosity? And he has even done that. How? Well, materially, your investment may not look like it's giving the yield that you would like. Sometimes, as you look around the building here and you look at the coffee that is offered, you might think that your investment is not, being, is not giving you the yield that you would like. I kind of like instant coffee, but I know some other people don't. But that's the coffee we have here. And the building may have a bit of a whiff of damp and have other issues around it, although after the working bee yesterday, it's looking a lot better shape now. But you may sometimes think that as you give money to this church, you don't get the yield that you would like materially. But have you considered that God has met all your material needs generously over the years as you've been supporting the work here at Des Moines Baptist Church? Have you ever lacked food? Have you ever lacked clothing? As you've given money to this church, have you ever lacked a roof over your head? Or has God fulfilled his promise? As you have been generous, he has met all your needs. And of course, don't you look forward to meeting, seeing your needs met for all eternity. As you've been generous here, aren't you now looking forward to material gain in the life to come that the world can't even imagine properly? streets made of gold, no pain, 
no hunger, no thirst, no death. That is what we look forward to. As you've given generously at Des Moines Baptist Church, do you realise that is the yield on your investment? That is what you are looking forward to. And so can't we rejoice in the interest, the credit that is coming to our account? The dividends, I'm not sure everyone knows what a dividend is, but that, that, that is what is given back from a company that you have invested in, you've generously given to that company, and you get a return don't you rejoice in that as much as you might re rejoice in a return coming into your bank account for one of your investments? The fact that all your material needs will be met for eternity. And hasn't, haven't your investments here at Des Moines Baptist, haven't they yielded spiritual credit as well? Spiritual credit to your account. Now there may be bad quarters where the sermons are not as engaging as you would like. Maybe you prefer when I preach on Paul as opposed to when I preach on Samuel, which is where we're going to next week, Lord willing. We're returning to 1 Samuel. I've been there a number of times and we go away, we come back. And I do hear from time to time people say, I really enjoy when you preach through Colossians. Samuel, not so much. Okay? It may be a bit of a bad quarter for you when I'm preaching in Samuel. Or another book of the Bible, one of the minor prophets. Oh, yes, it's not as engaging as when you preach on Paul or you preach on John's gospel. And sometimes the elders may fail you. They fail you with their counsel. And sometimes it may be that the members are not as kind to you as you expect. There may be bad quarters. But hasn't God credited you with much spiritual blessing despite the failings of the local church? As you've sinned over the years and you've been here at Des Moines Baptist Church, haven't you known the joy of forgiveness again and again in this place? Haven't you found grace administered to your hungry soul Sunday by Sunday in this church? Isn't that a spiritual yield from your investment in this place? Haven't you grown in your knowledge of God and his son, Jesus Christ, during your time here? Even as I've just read the Bible, I may not preach it as well as I could. I always feel that I don't preach as well as I could. But haven't you heard something more about the Lord who made you and sustains you and has redeemed you? Haven't godly people been praying for you? Remember the spiritual needs that we have? We need that knowledge. We need that forgiveness of sins. And we need people to pray for us. Haven't people been praying for you by the power of the Holy Spirit in this place? I have a prayer list. I'm at least praying for you. But I know many of the people in the church, they use their prayer directories. We publish those prayer directories so that people know who the members of the church are and so they know who they're supposed to be praying for. We have the prayer meeting so that people are praying for you. Basically, if you visit this church once or twice, you get on the list for a time. And people will be praying for you. And haven't you enjoyed holiness and peace and love and fellowship in this church? Those needs that you have for good works. Can't you look back on your time here and say that I came to this church and a year ago and I'm a better person today as a result of supporting the work here, that I have grown in grace in this time here, that God has been meeting my need to do good works as a result of being in this place and can't you see others growing others growing which are a return on your investment it's this wonderful thing that you see people growing they are they're growing as a result of the investment that you have made and then you're getting a return but they're getting a return as well and won't of course your investment yield great spiritual return when you reach heaven when you reach heaven won't Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. So like the Apostle Paul, let us rejoice in the Lord for the fruit, the credit that is coming to our account and has come to our account for our gifts to the work of Christ Jesus in this place. Worldly investments, they may be tanking at the moment, but the yield from spiritual investments never fails. The yield never fails. And it compounds upon itself. By the Spirit's power, more fruit comes as a result of the seed of the fruit that comes. It's compounding interest. As the gospel advances, others are helped, and then they help others, and then they help others, and then they help others, and it just continues. The return may be small from time to time, 
but there is a fat return coming in the next life. An amazing yield on our investment is coming. So it doesn't really matter if the coffee is pretty bad in this place, because we're not a cafe. We, we, we have something far better. We have the living God, and he supplies all our needs. We can never compete with the cafes in Vermoyne. But we have God amongst us, and he has promised to meet the needs of everyone who invests in the work of Christ here. Now, some of you may not have been as generous as you could have been here to the work. You may even be visiting today, and so you may want to start giving to the work here so that you too can have the promise of God made to you, that you can start having a yield on an investment here, and that God will meet all your needs. But before you do, I want you to understand something. God's blessing... God's promise of meeting all your needs doesn't come to everyone who is generous to the church. There are many people who have given generously to churches, to pastors, to missionaries through church history, but their needs are not met. And particularly their eternal needs are not met. Materially, spiritually, now or for eternity, they have found that they cannot buy the gift of God with money. Simon learnt that lesson in the book of Acts that he cannot buy the gift of God with money. So how do we receive the blessing of God? It's because of a gift that God gave many years ago, that God gave many years ago to the church. What am I talking about? How are all our needs met? How are they all met? Well, what does verse 19 actually say? What does the promise say? Verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs. Full stop? No, it continues. According to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It's Christ Jesus. He is the gift by which all blessings come. God invested his son and his son invested his life in the church so that we could all be blessed materially, and spiritually, now and forever. If you want the blessing of God, if you want your needs to be met materially and spiritually, don't put money into our bank account as a means to get that. Don't do it. Trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus Christ. God is the one who invests the capital, the capital, so that sinners can then be forgiven and become rich. You must say with Augustus Top Lady, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling, naked come to you for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die. Top lady didn't come in with anything in his hands and say, you must meet my needs now, God, because I have given. No, it is naked that he comes and is dressed by God. And so if you want your needs met, you need to go to Christ. That is where all our needs are met. And they're met according to the riches in Christ Jesus. And then you can give generously to the church. Why? Because you delight in God's gift that he has already given to you. Generosity then becomes a mark of those who already have a return on Christ's investment. They're already blessed because of the gift that God has given in Christ Jesus. People outside the church think it's crazy. Why would you invest when the main return is after death? Why would you invest in any kind of work where the main return is after death? But it's not crazy for those who know the joy of Christ, who know the joy of knowing Christ. And as new converts, you can see it, they're thrilled to give to the work of God because they want others to enjoy the gift too. They want the gospel to go forward. And so they give generously so that Christ would be known by other people. They want to see God blessing them with a rich return, but they already know they have a rich return in Christ Jesus. They want others to experience the rich return that comes through trusting in Christ. 
and it's a mark for everyone. As I said, it's the newly converted Macedonians. It's not a case of, well, you're a Christian for a year or so and then you might think about giving. People like to joke, the last part of a man, a Christian to be converted is his wallet. New converts were giving, and we learn from 2 Corinthians that the Macedonians gave out of their extreme poverty. They didn't have much to begin with, but they gave. Why? Because it's the mark of the Christian, and it's the mark of a Christian that they can't help but give because they love the Lord Jesus, and they want to see Jesus made known, and they found this guy called Paul, and he is making Christ known, and so of course they want to support him in his work. So let us all rejoice in giving. But like the Apostle Paul, let us always give glory back to God. And that's what the Apostle Paul does, doesn't he? Verse 20, how does he end this section? To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Why does he say that? Because he's just spoken about where all our gifts come from, where all the blessing comes from. It's from Christ Jesus. So what should I do in response to remembering that the capital that yields a return is all from God's gift many years ago? I have to give him the glory. Our initial blessing and then the blessing that we receive from our generosity, the way the promise is fulfilled, God supplies all our needs as a result of the giving that we have given, the the gifts that we have given. It's all because of Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in our lives. All our gifts and blessings are simply dividends and interest upon the capital of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. We should never think that when we give to the church, we're somehow producing our own capital that then we give to the church. No, that's interest on Christ Jesus capital which was given many years ago and so we're just supplying what has already come from him our giving is simply a reinvestment on the return of Christ's investment that yields further interest and so just like the apostle Paul we should cry to our God and Father be glory forever and ever amen why because we give God glory for his initial capital and we give God glory for the interest on that capital, the compound interest that we see. And so our giving is never about us and making a name for us here at Des Moines Baptist Church and making a name for Joel Radford. Who is Joel Radford? No, our giving is making a name for Christ Jesus, making him known and the generosity of him so many years ago and from the Heavenly Father. Let's come to him now. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you as our loving and generous God. We thank you for giving us your Son, through whom you meet all our needs now and forevermore. Oh Lord, we thank you for the generosity of many of your people over the years of this place. And help us to be con- continue to be generous as a result of your generosity so many years ago. And then rejoice in the fruit that comes to our account, the credit that comes to our account as a result. And so then give you the glory for great things you have done. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.